Mel Gibson is here. He has made 33 films, becoming one of the most successful actors in the history of film. He was born in Peekskill, New York. At the age of 12, he moved to Australia with his family. He graduated from the National Institute of Dramatic Arts in Sydney. It was his work on stage that caught the attention of director George Miller, who cast him in Mad Max. But the film Lethal Weapon made him a big box office star. In 1995, he won Oscars for the Best Picture and Best Director for the film Braveheart. Here is a brief look at some of the films in his career. Are you not to be? That is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. Is it this? Is this what you see? I assure you, it is human. But if that's all you see, well then, you don't see me. You can't see me. You! What were you saying before I went out? What, what you called me something. Nothing, 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 nothing important. I believe he called you a gutless coward. No, I did not say that. I, I, I might have said a gutless cheat, but, but never, cheat. never a coward. Cheat! Never call a man a coward. I was teasing. Teasing! This badge ain't real. You ain't real. Oh, you sure are a crazy son of a b <laughs> yeah. You think I'm crazy? Yeah. Are you calling me crazy? You think yeah. I'm crazy? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you want to see crazy? I'll tell you. <laughs> so you've got children? Well, not yet, but I was hoping that you could help me with that. So you want me to marry you then? Well, it's a bit sudden, but all right. Your duty is to your family. Don't you walk away from me, boy. I'm sorry, Father. I'll find you when this is all over. No, you're not going. I, I forbid you to go. I'm not a child. You're my child. I don't get my son back, and I mean real soon. You better kill yourself. Because when I catch up with you, I'm going to take my goddamn time. By the time we're finished, you're going to wish you weren't born. I'll have your head on a f***ing pike. You understand me? This new film is what women want, his first romantic comedy. Here is the trailer from that film. Oh, God, I just looked at his crotch. Oh, I hope he didn't see me. <laughs> oh, I just looked at it again. Stop it. <laughs> what Women Want, a Nancy Myers film. I can't believe this is what I'll be wearing the last night. I'm a virgin. <gasps> I'm pleased to welcome Mel Gibson to this program for the first time. Hey, thank you. Great to have you. Yeah, good to be here. Last time I saw you, you were down in South Carolina yeah. shooting Patriot. That's right. Getting calluses. And now a romantic comedy. Yeah. <laughs> Would the character in Patriot understand the character in well, What Women Want? 200 years of difference, I don't think so. <laughs> a different breed of guy. Uh, I'm afraid that guy in the Patriot wouldn't even know how to flush <laughs> or floss. <laughs> yeah. It wouldn't be the same kind of yeah. thing. First romantic comedy? Um, well, it, it, yes, I guess in a pure sense, yeah, because uh, um, the other thing I did once that was attempted that was more like an action film. So, which you know, in a particular one, John Badham and Goldie oh, Hawn yeah, yeah. years ago was a, uh, this. This was purely, you know, a throwback to those those uh, comedies you used to see in yeah. the 30s, 40s, 50s. Something you wanted to do for a while, or would they have to talk you into this? No, not really. Well, I, I suppose I had to have. A, there was a little arm twisting, you know, but it was. Um, and how do you they twist your arm? Well, you have lunch with the director, and <laughs> she says, "Come on, do this because then." Uh, and uh, uh, you know, the reason for reticence on my part, I think, was that was the uh, that they're difficult. Yeah, they're difficult. To Comedy pull is off. harder than action. Yeah, Edmund Keen uh, dying, saying dying is easy and comedy is hard, it's things tricky. like that. You know, yeah. so and and it is tricky. You know? um, what's hard about it? Just um, well, I think. It has to look effortless, and, and a great deal of effort goes into making it look that, mm -hmm. that way, effortless. And the, the minute it uh, begins to look at all contrived, I think uh, yeah, it's not funny anymore. Yeah. <laughs> Were you a ser serious student of acting? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, well, not at first. I kind of stumbled into it. I just found myself there. The you know, fickle finger of fate kind of pushed me into the acting school. Because you, we thought this might be fun to do, or well, it was. It, I, I thought it might have been fun. I wasn't. I didn't do it through high school and stuff. Uh, you didn't. You're not one of these kids that sat in the theater saying, "Oh God," had this sort of romantic obsession about movies. Not at all. I mean, I like movies, but yeah. I didn't. And and it certainly, the, the place I ended up had nothing to do with movies. It was a theatrical yeah. 
training place, you know, very much in the British style of... Uh, this is in Sydney? In Sydney, yeah. Yeah, the National Institute of Dramatic Art, where they had uh, uh, people mostly from Britain kind of teaching the craft of stagecraft and speech and movement and all these other things. So um, I sort of found myself there. Yeah, you go in for an audition, and they, it, was a, it was a picking yeah. process. They pick. You couldn't pay for it, and it was um, not many people. And my sister arranged it for me, and I tried it because, you know, I was trying everything. And uh, I was accepted, and I thought, well, why not? I'll give it a whirl. But it was about a year, I'd say, that I was there before I kind of decided that I even began to understand what it was about or even like it. What did you like? Just the fact you can get inside somebody's character and tell a story? Just that. It was... Uh, I remember, um, well, I was there for a year and I had a lot of hair and uh, no one quite knew who was hiding back there. It was <laughs> yes. like just, you know, a lot of hair and beard and everything. And, and um, I didn't say much. I never did say much. And um, um, they gave me an exercise that was with research, you know, and I, I picked on somebody from history that I really dug, Alexander the Great, and I thought, oh, I'll just read up. And I really studied this guy and really found out about all his campaigns and stuff and got impressions of who he must have been. He must have been a genius. Conquered and, the known world. Yeah, yeah. 32, you died. Yeah, and he did wild stuff like, uh, <laughs> you know, the Gordian knot here, yeah. the Gordian knot. No. Where, oh, it was, the, the thing was that whoever could unravel this yeah. incredible, you know, knot would, would conquer the world. And he, he went to the Gordian knot and looked at it. And it was, you know, he could have sat there all year and tried to unknot it, but he, he looked at it, he looked at the up and down, and he... He turned around to one of his guys and said, let me your sword, will you? And he went and just hacked it to pieces, which was like, okay, that's how you do it. <laughs> and that's how he did it. Yeah. He, he, was a, he didn't mess around. You've never made a movie about him, though? No. Ever wanted to? I did. I did, but uh, um, not, not with me in it. You no. know. Um, I think Spielberg was actually toying with the idea at one stage, too. It's a fascinating character. It is. PBS did a series, a four or five hour series about him, and they yeah. traced the whole journey. Yeah. Of Alexander the Great. What a trick. Oh, I know. And just as he was getting just as he was getting a handle on stuff, he, he kicks a bucket. He you know, why did he die? What did he die of? I think he got very ill, of course. Yeah. There was all kinds of like you yeah. know, he went through Asia Minor and beyond, you know, and conquered the known world and who knows what kind of bugs were lurking out there for the poor Macedonians. But uh he um I think that the illness was brought on by he actually killed his lover. He you know, drunken temper. He actually threw a spear through the guy. Yeah. And uh, and killed him, nailed him to a wall. And he didn't come out of his tent for like a hundred days. He was just in there grieving at, a, at what he'd done. Now, this was near the end, or was this sort of... It wasn't far from the end, yeah. yeah. I, 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 but he went on, but I think it just like took its toll on him, you know. And uh, he got sick and died. Yeah. I think he had enough. He'd said, I'm bored, you know. <laughs> I want to get out no, of here. Nothing else for me to do. Yeah. No more mountains to climb, no more yeah. countries to conquer. No, I've done it. Let me out. Yeah. Yeah. See, what, see what the next realm is like. Yeah. Anything else, any other historical character that so fascinates you that you'd like to mm. play? Mm, um, oh, God, I, I know there is. I just, yeah. I'm just grabbing at straws here. Well, I Hopkins think. told me I always wanted to play Sir Anthony. Always wanted to play Napoleon. Yeah. Same idea, I assume. Yeah, yeah. Napoleon, wow. Well, there was a guy full of... Uh, <laughs> ambition. Yeah, 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 ambition and diseases, <laughs> apparently. He was, uh, yeah. he was riddled with everything. He had so many defects. Yeah. It's amazing that he lived as long as he did. And they, some think he died of arsenic poisoning, that they poisoned him to death. Yeah, he sat in a razor. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you an arsenic. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, so we're back in Sydney. Yeah. Thinking about all this. And, and is it George Miller? Is that his name? George Miller. Yeah. S was thinking about Mad Max? I guess so. He was a, he was a doctor. Yeah. And, uh, but his real passion lay in film making. Um, Came to you and said, audition for this. Not really. Uh, it was, um, he just, I think he, he, got, he pulled his friends because in those days in Australia, it was the late 70s, uh, um, film had been pretty healthy down there. And I believe that the first uh, feature length film was actually made in Australia. Yeah, it still survives. Yeah. It's a pretty nasty looking print, but it was called The Kelly Gang. I think it was like 1900. I can't remember, four, 1907, something like that. Yeah. But, um, uh, there was like this new wave came through in the 70s where people got it together, people with the know-how, well, not that much know-how, but certainly a lot of heart and talent. And uh, But so he went to all his friends, chemists, you know, pharmacy people and other doctors, and he raised about $300,000, which in those days, I guess, you know, would go a lot further, and uh, set about making his little story. 
and he hadn't really directed a, a feature before. There was a story that you were sort of banged up and you came in, yeah. and he said, that's the look I'm on. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, well, I uh, almost, almost, he almost got it right. I, I, I was, I, I did get into a, a drunken brawl, and I didn't look too happy after it. Yeah. It was, a, there was a lot of people involved. It was like four, three of them were on one side, but I got the living daylights kicked out of me. And it was, um, I, I came into an audition with a friend who'd been called to an audition, and, and sat in the waiting room waiting for him. And the, the casting people came out and just like, looked at me and uh, they said, "What the hell happened to you?" And, I gave him a brief explanation. I was a little embarrassed about it. And, uh, he said it fit the character. I no. thought I'd make up myself. Well, <laughs> well, I wasn't even invited to this audition. They said, let us take a few Polaroids. So I'm like, yeah. being a, an extrovert, not really, but they, they took a few snaps of me and kept them on file. and said, come on in a couple of weeks after you healed up. So. Some of the stories about you at that time say you were shy. Uh, extremely, yeah. yeah. Um, you well, overcame it. I think, uh, I think, you know the, the 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 acting and the business of going about becoming an actor um, is like therapy for that kind of stuff. Yeah, in fact, some people go out because it's a way to escape themselves into being somebody else. That's it. Yeah, I totally. I to I felt totally comfortable being having having the mask or having the convention of uh, you know the bag on your head kind of thing and say, well, this is somebody else, and then expressing whatever was oozing out. You know, it was a, a great freedom. After Mad Max, was it filmed for you then? I mean, it just made it turn the much. corner. Yeah, they started coming after that. I went to a theater company down in South Australia and did spear caddying for three or four months down there and, uh, you know, in various repertory Shakespeare's and what have you. Um, after that, then, you know, then somebody came to visit me and said, hey, it's got a film here. And films were very few and far between. And you didn't, it wasn't a thing where you, you know, I wasn't too judicious about, you know, what scripts or anything like that. I just did whatever came along to um, make the bank account happen. So, But you're going back to, you were actually going to go back and direct Robert Downey Jr. Yeah. On stage. I was. Yeah. And might that still happen, or are you going to... I, I certainly hope so. You, you think he'd be dramatic and, and fabulous as... Is it Hamlet? The Dane. Yeah. The Dane. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. He, he would be dynamic. It, this was your idea, or did somebody come to you and say... How about, I thought that up because I just, you know, you just watch him and he's just, he's such a complex, he, he is, he's, he's such an unusual guy yeah. that his Hamlet would be extraordinary, I would think. Um, because there's many of, uh, there's as many Hamlets as there is of us, you know. Um, every great actor, every good actor, every mediocre actor yeah, wants, wants to, do to it. try it. Yeah. And I feel I didn't do it, you know. Uh, that's you another reason for it. Yeah. It's it, it's a it's a curious thing because it, it, I never did it on stage. I read it, of course, but um, you know that's that's not doing it. And uh, of course, we did it on film, right. and uh, it was a very rushed production and kind of confused production. Uh, it was Icon's first production. That's my film company, and um, so we never rehearsed it even. Um, it you was, did Hamlet without rehearsing. Y yeah. We didn't actually have any kind of rehearsal like one would have on stage or anything. And you didn't watch Richard Burton or you didn't watch anybody else do it? You didn't go see or...? No, nah, not really. Not not in the immediate. You know, I'd seen old no. film versions with uh, Nicole Williamson right, and right. Laurence Olivier right. and so forth. But I, um, we didn't rehearse it. And then we, when you shoot it, you shoot it in pieces out of order. And you'll do the last part of a soliloquy a month before you do the first two-thirds so of it. So it's much harder to do it on film because it has such a natural progression. Yeah. Or, mm. or it doesn't. I, maybe that's or the best way to do it. Who knows? <laughs> but you said you wish you would, had done it on stage rather than on film. Yeah. yeah. Are yeah. you disappointed in the film thing, or just uh, to a degree? I think it, it, it's good because it's accessible and um, and, and reaches a, a wide audience because of that. It's not the most complex rendering you'll ever see. It's it's only two of what should be four hours, which is like you know yeah. a lot better on the boredom factor. <laughs> yeah. Do you take risk? I mean, obviously that was a risk for you. A little, stretch. Yeah. Sure. I mean, you don't know whether people want to see Hamlet on film, first of all. No. You, you might know they don't want to see four hours. But I'll tell you what, it was the damnedest thing to raise the, the money the money for that, because everyone's going, what is he doing? You know? Even my agent was, no, I don't know. <laughs> <It's>, uh, <laughs> now, uh, do you really want to do this? No, I'll think about this. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, it, I thought, yeah, I'll try it. You know, What do you got to lose? See, yeah. the worst thing, that's the best thing you learn from drama school, I think, is that all you can do is fail, and you know, nobody's dying or anything. It's just... 
only you on stage, you know. Back to this, and we'll come back to the life. But, I mean, is this a stretch for you at all, just doing this romantic comedy? Well, I, I guess it's a little different avenue from what is expected of me. You know, it's not Braveheart, it's not Lethal Weapon, and it's not Conspiracy. No. <laughs> for sure. No. <laughs> no, but it's it's fun, you know. Um, um, you know, it's a a premise of that I thought was really cool. I mean, it's I think everybody on the planet is at one time or other had the whole fantasy of being able to uh, step inside the mind of, of people, but particularly the, the opposite, opposite gender. gender. Yeah. Yeah. What'd and, you learn? Uh, what did I learn from making the well, film? Yeah. I mean, well, I mean, well, I mean, everybody wants to step inside. It is a fantasy. Yeah, it's sure. it like to be inside of you know. And most of us have had lots of conversation with women in our lives about what's it like to be. To be a guy or what? No, what's, it, what's in your head? You know, oh, why sure. do you think you this kidding? way? And, yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, oh, yeah. We've all had to deal with yeah, exactly. it. Exactly. All. You know, every, every single day you have to deal with the yeah. sexual dynamics yeah. in one and way. And you got to have a conversation with your daughter and with your, you know, and your mother and mother. All yeah. your older sisters and yeah. your wife. And yeah. But did, so did you come away with someone real understanding of women that you didn't think you had? Well, or you I thought you had it pretty knocked before you went into this movie. I ain't got it knocked. I'm, I don't think. Well, <laughs> I don't think I'll get to the bottom of the whole no, mystery. No. But yeah. Um, but I think every couple of years you're you're gifted with some kind of cosmic epiphany. Yeah. So it's um, uh, you, you just kind of edge a little closer to to an understanding, or maybe, hey, maybe. I don't know. Somehow, I think uh, with time, I think the sexes kind of get closer together somehow. Yeah. So it's a good thing. I, I mean, you hear. When you see couples, you've been together with Robin for how many years? Twenty. Yeah. yeah. I mean, well, there, longer actually, but we've been married but, twenty. But I mean, there is there is that thing that happens in which you, for people, when we say realize we're in this for life. Yeah. You know. I mean, right. for better or worse. Yeah. This is it. Yeah. Right. And you get there and you think, geez, I better start being nice to them. They might withhold my pills, you know, <laughs> later on. They might not get me my depends. <laughs> you have to depend on yeah. them. Tell me about Nick Marshall. Um. He's Your kinda, character. Well, yeah, he's he's, he's uh, Nick is uh, he's kind of uh, kind of a Rat Pack guy. He's kind of Vegas suave, kind of uh, nice clothes. Probably wears a little jewelry even, <laughs> although he doesn't wear it in this. <laughs> he's, he's lost. His, he's probably lost a couple of wedding rings along the way, but he uh, he has a nice watch. Yeah. And uh, he likes vodka, broads, cigarettes, and he he has a very high opinion of himself. He, he has a healthy ego. And what happens to him? Well, you know, if you fall into a bathtub with a hairdryer that's on and you get electrocuted, <laughs> chances are you're going to wake up, if you live, somewhere else, hearing women's <laughs> thoughts, you see? So yeah. This is what happens to him. So he uh, he gets an education. He, his ego takes a bath, uh, and uh, he learns a little bit. But he inadvertently, I think, uh, just by the mechanics of the plot and everything, he's putting himself in somebody else's head, which means he's putting himself in someone else's shoes. And as Will Rogers says, you know, it, it inadvertently he becomes more selfless, so it's a morality tale of sorts. Right. You know. Roll tape. Here is a scene in which he uh, thinks he's getting a big promotion. I am. I'm stressed. I'm stressed. I have a lot on my plate. So let's not talk about this now. Huh? Why don't I meet you here, say tomorrow, ten, ten thirty? Okay, that would be good. So that's a date. It's a date. Thank you, <laughs> sir. Oh, that was inspiring. <laughs> <laughs> to nix him over. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's always on the prowl. He's always on the make. Yeah. There is this, some people say about you, that about 44 you are now. Yeah. You're just hitting a kind of creative stride. <laughs> <laughs> oh, let's hope that something's going to work. Right? Uh, yeah. let's, let's hope so. Yeah, you just start to get the uh, yeah, hang of it. The it's like Alexander it. the Great, you know, you just getting the hang of conquering everything. And, yeah, he croaks. Yeah. yeah. Did you feel that, though? Um, no, not really. I feel pretty good, actually. Uh, you mean the evolution of where you've been? Feel pretty good about that too. Sure, and I, I think it's a healthy thing to be able to look back and go, "Wow, what was I thinking? What kind of choices were they?" Because it tells you that you've got different objectives now, which is which is a good thing. Yeah. You've done a, an amazing job. This is Icon Productions, your company. Mm -hmm. Uh, you do films that you're not starring in. Yeah. You do a lot of things. I mean, you have offices, I guess, in London as mm -hmm. well. Yeah, I've got a distribution yeah. company in London. In London. Something in Sydney. Yeah, kicking yeah. off in Sydney. I mean, why? Is there a model for doing this? Or were you just a guy that said, I want to control my destiny and whatever I can do to make that happen? Yeah, I guess I wanted a certain amount of, you know, freedom in the, in the choice of, you know, where I went. And, uh, and I like the idea of creating. 
and not just creating for stuff for myself, but like I, I have this whole fantastic. It's like one of you see Downey do Hamlet. I just want to, and I, I can't do it now, but I'd like to see him do it. You know, there, there's a joy in that, and there's a joy in creation. I think that's, uh, um, and unfortunately, you have to get the whole corporate side of it and the money side of it up in order to afford that luxury which is, hey, that's creativity in itself, you know, that whole money Are you thing. good at that? No. I'm notorious. I'm a financial, fiscal imbecile, you know, and uh, therefore I have to have somebody very trusted and good and but solid. But you have to make the sale, don't you? In some cases, yes, but not always. If it's not starring you, you don't have to do it? Not necessarily. Uh, um, there's ways to do it. I mean, and, and there's good people with me, creative people, uh, good money people. Do you say when somebody wants you badly for a film, great I'll do it but let's be partners I have done yeah yeah and um, you get the production company into it and, and uh, then you have a stake in its distribution overseas and so forth Braveheart mm. for you yeah that's a big um, um, for me it was a big step I, I think uh, something of that magnitude the scale of it was huge and they didn't throw money at it it was um, that was a hard sell too yeah well, not really. Well, they, they picked it up all right. They just didn't want to give me any money. So, no, so we'll, we'll, we'll back you, but not with the amount of money you want? Well, you know, we did a budget, and it like huge. I mean, horses, yeah. guys, you right. know, swords. Yeah. And Period piece. Yeah, huge. And uh, but, and we didn't get what the, what we said, but we found ways to get it, yeah. which is, there's, a, there's an art in that, I'll tell you. Were you surprised it won the Oscars? Um, I mean, did you think about that when you were making it? Did you think about... At some point, we've got something that's damn good here. I, I really loved it. I, I just thought that... You did uh, think about This is... Well... I don't see anything better, you might have said. I had a dream. <clears throat> it was really weird. <laughs> and it was really weird because I had an assistant at the time called... His name was Dean. And he'd been with me a couple of years. He was an incredible guy. He's funny. And um, I woke up one day, and, and he came into the room, and, and he said, I had a dream last night. I said, so did I. It was the weirdest dream ever. We were in pre-production. I said, I dreamed we were wearing tuxedos and crying. And he said, <gasps> he, he nearly had a heart attack on the spot. He had the same dream. It was really strange. It what was, does this say to you? It says that, that there's some psychic thing out there that works. There's m more things in heaven and earth that are dreamt of in our <laughs> philosophy, Horatio. It's like... Yeah. Uh, it's just one of those things. I mean, I have no problem believing in the supernatural world and all that encompasses, you know. So I, I, I just kind of said, oh, that's, yeah, that's interesting. And none of, neither one of us said the O word because yeah. we didn't want to jinx it, but yeah. we just say, oh, same dream. <laughs> tuxedos, but, but you didn't say statute or anything like that. No, we were in tuxedos yeah. and we were crying. <laughs> Yeah. And then and did that happen when, when you uh, won? When we actually won, we weren't crying, we were laughing, but the guy grabbed a glass of water and threw it on his face. And went, <laughs> <laughs> he says, there, I just needed to fulfill the prophecy, you know. It was like, yeah. That's great. Yeah, he's a funny guy. <laughs> but, it, but did it change things for you after you'd done that? Um, hmm. Well, it did, you know. It, 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 it does something for you, which I think is, is good. Because for self-esteem, for a sense of, because you were directing this. Yeah. Absolutely, and, and you know, the, there was a lot of passion involved in it. Uh, but you're never really completely sure that you're on the right track or in the right field, you know. It's a, uh, so it was, for me, it was a confirmation of that. And I, it, it kind of made me say, well, I, I kind of must be going in the right direction or know what I'm doing here. I can tell a story. I can um, tell it on cellulite with lots of things, you know. Um, so it felt good. And it felt good that people liked it, you know, that they that you could share it with them and that they were able to access it, you know, that you made it a story that they could digest. You could all public dream together. But here's what's interesting. You haven't tried to duplicate that. Not since, no. Yeah. No. No. I mean, you haven't engaged some epic. No. You, know, you didn't direct Patriot. You didn't take that out, something you wanted to, no. to do. Why not? No. I, no. Why not say, if I did it once, I can do it twice? I don't want to do the epic thing now. I, you it, don't? No, I want to move on and do something else. Um, I don't know what that is, but if you're going to spend a couple of years of your life... Romantic comedy, you're Cary Grant. <laughs> right, that's it. <laughs> hey. um, if you're going to spend a couple of years of your life... Yeah, you want to make sure it's something, you know, like worthy material that you can keep your spark alive for. Did you have any sense of how much the demand of time being a director would take? Um, I had an idea while I'd done it before. Yeah, but this is a whole different scale. Yeah, it was a, you know, it's a much bigger... Um, so I understood that. But Man they, Without Face, was that the first? Yeah, it was a dabble. Yeah, exactly. 
and uh, you know, low budget and, and not very many performers. And but you never wanted to go out and say, or was it a sense I've done it, I've shown you I could do it, you know, I don't have to do this again, or just nothing presented itself to you that was so enticing that you were willing to nothing's grabbed and take the plunge. A couple of things have grabbed me, but they don't always come together. I mean, it's hard. And I don't have, well, I suppose I, I, I probably have an advantage. Uh, you know, I can get on a fast track with things if I can really, really go. But it doesn't necessarily mean that difficult material is going to... Here's what's interesting. You've done everything. I mean, you've done all kinds of roles. Action, adventure, yeah. you know, romantic comedy, period pieces, uh, a whole lot of stuff. You've shown you can direct. You know, you've shown you can produce. You would think that if anybody, if anybody has a look at great material, you'd be it. Do you see a lot of stuff? I mean, is, is your desk full of projects you wish you had time to do? Yeah, and you, and you can't do them all. And so the art is choosing that that's most likely yeah. to make you happy, to yeah. do well, and be a challenge. Yeah, that's all. It's just the one that's the most interesting. And for one reason or another, it could be, I mean, one week you'll make one choice, and another week you might do something else. But once you kind of commit to something, you, you, you're there. You can't change your mind halfway through. So you have to be a little mature about that. What's the biggest mistake you've ever made? Oh, wow. Well. Mm. Gee. I don't think there have been any really bad blunders. Well, I mean I, by that uh, also roles that you wish you'd taken. It turned out that right. a lot of creative people came together and made a hell of a film, yeah. and it would have been perfect for you if you hadn't said no. Geez, I remember a while back a Rain Man came. Yeah. And that, that was kind of a cool thing. And, and uh, you would have had the Hoffman role for that, or the probably, Dustin? yeah, the Hoffman role. I, I don't know. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. And and he did it one. You see, now here's the the, the great that, thing that about role that role would have is, been any age. I mean, yeah, thing. but the great thing about that is that he did it. Yeah, that's right. And that's and he that was meant it. to be. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And he was wonderful in it. Um, and so, and so was Tom. Tom was like great in that. He was. That, yeah, that was that was a he's, good film. He's a damn good actor. Yeah, yeah. Cruz. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he's another guy like you who seems to have the production thing, the business thing. Yeah, the variety of things. He's willing to take risk. I mean, if you look at Fourth of July, stuff like that. Yeah. Don't yeah. you agree? Yeah, he plays with a bigger bankroll than I. I think it's like... Now, what does that mean, he plays with a bigger bankroll? Well, it's... I think... You didn't do badly. No, I'm, I am I just think I'm, I'm fairly cautious on that aspect uh, of things. He's I, go, I go slower, that's all. And he just goes for the big one. You know? <laughs> he goes for the big ring. And Do you good. watch that with admiration? Yeah. Yeah, he's got a lot of... Uh, does he have bigger... An energy and ambition, you know, he's, a, he's good. No, are you a little bit envious of that? No. Not of him, but the idea to be able to say, I'm going to go for it. I'm no, no, I like it. the way I'm doing it. I like doing it slow. You do? Yeah, I think, I think I'll get more out of it, and I think I'll learn more from it. And uh, Bruce and I, this is my partner. We've, I've known him since, mm -hmm. you know, for 20 years. He started off as a, a CPA, Chartered Public Accountant. He yeah, used to right. do my tax returns and stuff, and he's honest, straight shooting, you know, no-nonsense guy, knows money. And it, it, all and it, of us need a good accountant. Oh yeah, yeah. got to have someone to account to. Exactly. And uh, um, uh, we've 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 gone together like like kids in the woods. Like okay, we'll jump in. And it's a vicious business. I mean, it is. Any vicious, any business, I guess, is vicious. But Hollywood has its own brand of. It's hard. And uh, and we, we've taken a bath a bunch of times uh, in this game. And uh, both of us are like we sit there and now we. When did you take a bath? Oh gosh. Where? Yeah. Oh man, it's not public bathing. It's not like a public bath. <laughs> well, we're getting too, too weird here. No, but, come on. But, oh, you, you get ripped off and, like crazy. I mean, it's it's. Yeah. There's a lot of unscrupulous people in the business, and and it's easy to get caught in a spot where you make a mistake, mm -hmm. and every time you make a a mistake like that, I mean, hey, um, you can lose a million bucks, and um, uh, those kinds of things. We just look at each other and say, well, you have to just call them school fees. Yeah. Because um, that's how you learn. It's a cost of doing business. You got to take some chances. And you, you, you take know. a hit sometimes. It's yeah. like oh, sometimes it's like brutal. Yeah. And and there's a lot of there's a lot of people out there with the knives. Out. A lot of sharks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's like pirates. You know? yeah, but here's what they say about you too. A lot of people have said this: that this is a guy who has rage within him. Rage, rage within him. is what they say. Mm. And some of them, I mean, Jody Foster and others have said it as an admiring quality, but they think that's what I've had, I've read directors say, you have something that's there that is more powerful and more, uh, you know. And they look at it as something that's inside of you, a kind of. Yeah. Do you think that? Does that ring true to you at all? 
Yes, I think some... There, there's a meat axe guy in there someplace. He's a... <laughs> I don't know how to... I, I don't really understand it. It, it, it. I think there's such a thing called ancestral chi. Yeah. Some chiropractor yeah. once got into a file on me once, and he was like, hey, ancestral chi. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, what are you talking about? What kind of crap is that? And he, he's like, well, you get it from your mother, and she got it from her grandfather, and it's just yeah. through the generations. Yeah. You, you are the sum of everything that went before you in your line. Yeah. But the part of a, uh, do you think it's something you can touch as an actor? That's something that, that you you know is there, that you can reach. Yeah, there, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a madness. There's an insanity. I think we're all no. Who's who's normal? Who's sane? Who's yeah. sane? And what is sanity? <laughs> sanity is, I think, being able to keep a lid on the mad boy. Oh, know? sure. To yeah. keep everything. Yeah. In balance. Yeah, sure. We're all capable of nuttiness. So what's in you that's right you see in your father? Um, well, sometimes when I, when I watch a, uh, parts of a film, I mean, I see him. It's, yeah. it's really interesting because uh, physicality, movement-wise and rhythm-wise, yeah. I see yeah. it. And I'm like, wow, I'm becoming my dad, you know? And, um, um, but of course, I think everyone. He was a good father. He was, and and my mother was a great mother. And uh, if your parents are good parents, you're going to take a lot from them, just like people take things from bad parents. You know. Was it great growing up in a family of twelve? Indeed, brothers yeah. and sisters. And yeah. uh, I'm an only child, and sometimes I look with envy. Yeah. Just great envy. I think about great Thanksgivings and great Christmases, and and you know, and great vacations, and just. Yeah, they were uh, bedlam. Oh, no, I'm sure your mother thought it was great, but... <laughs> yeah, she was off her feet. She yeah. she worked hard. Yeah. Just the laundry thing alone. It's and, enough, yeah. Well, she went, she <laughs> I'll went, have 12 of everything. I think she went bananas one day when, you know, with the laundry thing. She'd had enough. and I was with my dad sitting in a... We were sitting in a, in a room with glass windows, and he was typing, you know, because he likes to write. Yeah. And I was yapping with him, and all of a sudden, we saw her wandering by the window. She kept going back and forth with armfuls of laundry. <laughs> and we sort of noticed her once, and we were yacking about something, and we noticed her again. So, what's she doing? And she was bringing the laundry out of the laundry room and taking it over and putting it in a big pile. Of she must be sorting colors or something. I don't know. Why is she doing it out there? And then she disappeared again for a little while, and then she very calmly walked out, and she had a can of, like, lighter fluid. No. Right. She starts, like, empty the lighter fluid on the laundry, and then she's, like, lighting matches, and oh, it's up like that, and we're like, what? She's losing her mind. And, and we, we went out, and we're both doing the Mexican hat dance all over it, you know, trying to put this thing, what the hell are you doing? He's, saying, he's like, and she's saying, I'm sick of laundry. She's like, she's like, oh, you know? It's great. It's like, uh, <laughs> this story's going to give so many people ideas. Oh, no, it's, you know. But it was, it was kind of like, and then she started, like, laughing about it, but, yeah. but like, it was like, she just had it, you know, she had to do that, you know? Yeah. And I, I really... Great therapy. At the time, I was like, it really kind of, like, woke me up. I thought, wow, she's really sick of laundry. <laughs> it's like, whoa. And then I thought, yeah, it would be horrible. Imagine, you know, having 11 kids and, and like, just the laundry alone would, like, uh, so she was she was a hard-working woman. Yeah. He, your dad left because of the Vietnam War. Is that why he went? No, not really. I mean, he, he, okay, it was that time. Yeah. It was that era. Uh, he'd hurt himself. His job was over. Uh, he'd retrained as a computer programmer. And, um, his mother's from there, and uh, you know, my brother was 18, you know, eligible for draft, you know, that kind of thing. And then he had, you know, four more sons, and he he himself, you know, volunteered for World War II, went off to Guadalcanal. Don't think he liked it very much. He didn't talk a hell of a lot about it, but don't think he dug it. Um, and I don't think it was like an escape mode because you could take us to Australia, we'd still get drafted. Yeah. I mean, there was nothing to stop you. Australia would draft you. Um, but when the Australians told, fought in the war, yeah, they did. And he said, but the reason he thought it was a good idea is to give you a year longer. Yeah. They wouldn't take you until you were like a year older. Yeah. Something may change by then. Yeah, something might change by then, and uh, and you'd have a little another year on you. You wouldn't be some kid. I mean, well, I've got two eighteen-year-old sons now, and uh, the thought of them going off someplace in a crazy war. No, come on. I mean, this is. This is a horror. This is horror to me. People have done it. You know, it must be very hard. Um, I can understand why he would like try and get an extra year out of it. Maybe hope it'd end or, or something like that. But uh, yeah, it wasn't really a dodge. It was just you know, 
just a postponement. Sure. Uh, and, you know, luckily by the time I came of age, it was all over. So, Take a look at this. This is another scene from What Women Want. Um, this is where uh, Alan Alda tells you that he isn't getting the big promotion that we saw this guy expecting. Here he is. This isn't easy for me, but I got the board breathing down my neck. She's coming in this afternoon. You'll meet her. Come on, roll with this. Work with her. Because she's got what I need to keep this place afloat. Well, she's got what you need, meaning she's a woman. You know how we can compete with that? Was it Julia Roberts that you would sing, you would send fr uh, frozen rats or something? Oh, yeah. Yeah, freeze-dried rats. Freeze -dried rats. <laughs> yeah, you can buy them down in the village. And, yes. <laughs> and what would you do? Send them just once or every day? Well, you get the same rat, and you keep repackaging it and, and, and sending it. And <laughs> what, what did she think of this? She keep opening the packages. <laughs> not that a woman likes better than a present. It's like... <laughs> He's do done it. again. Yeah. And then uh, you would think when it came in these damn boxes after seven, you'd know. No, well, she got wise after a couple. So, so then he had to have a different approach, you know. Yeah, so we'd right. sort of put KY jelly on his fur on his back to make him look really like nasty. And then we'd actually put him in the toilet in her trailer, and she'd like open it up to <laughs> be like. So everywhere she went, this rat. Yeah. Was... Yeah. But it was funny. She women reacted so vigorously. Women love you. They do. I, I love asked women. Jodie Foster yeah. said wonderful things about you. Oh, that was nice of her. Well, you know that. No, she's yeah, she's sweet. Shall I go down the list? Well, <laughs> 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 I mean, you have co-stars. They sure. do. I mean, they say a it's it's because of some professionalism, some sense of fun you have, hmm. and th thirdly, uh, there's a sense that that you care that you care. I do. I think I you know, I do. And I want to give to That's them. That's what they say, giving. Yeah. Um, uh, and um, and I guess very early on, you know, I, from very early on, there's a sense of like, um, with people in the in the same profession and working together, there has to be a certain level of of giving, and that's a kind of a love thing. It's it's a. Not that you're going to go and have an affair. You d I don't. I mean, that's the rule is, you know. You know, you don't go on this merry-go-round where you have affairs with everybody. Everybody you work with Come on, you'll end up just used up. Um, but there's 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 something a lot bigger you can like leave with them, you know. And and uh, then when you see them again, hey, your friends, you know, you don't have some squab going on or, you know, it. it yeah, I, I had a relationship real early on in, in film with someone, and it just like doesn't work for the working situation, and you don't enjoy it. It's, uh, um, it becomes about something else, and. Uh, you know, you're not there to do what you're paid to do, and you can't do it as well as you should. It's distracting. Yeah, it's a distraction, and um, um, so yeah, and uh, you know, I just I think what what I do is I well, I love women. I, I love women. I think women are great. I have five older sisters and a mother, and mm. um, you know, so I was raised with a respect for them, and they used to take care of me, and they were very responsible, and. Uh, but I think, you know, when I see women, I just dig them. I think they're great. You know? yeah. A lot of guys hate them. How many daughters do you have? Just one. Just one? Mm. How many How many sons? Uh, six. Six. Mm. Oh, six. Is the daughter the youngest? She's the oldest. She's the daughter's the oldest. Yeah, so you have a daughter, and then you had six? Yeah, six boys in rapid yeah. succession, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Except for the last guy. He's very young. He's 20 months old, so. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, he's a, uh, he's bring, he's the caboose. He's bringing up the, <laughs> so that the other kids can almost be, sort of quasi parents too. Yeah, but that's that's what it was like for me growing up. I had sisters. The three of them, the, the and the closest in age to me of these three was nine years older than me. They were all like older, so they were like, other mothers in a way. You know, they used to take care of you. Take a look at this. This is where uh, you realize you're falling in love with Helen Hunt. Oh, I'm a grown woman. Just say it. Do you want to come back to my place? Say it. Do you want to come... Good night, Darcy. Good night. I was talking as we were watching this, and I was talking about Peter O'Toole, who yes. we've got a profile coming up with, which I did in England. Yeah. And he reminds me of you in terms of... You seem like a guy who reads a lot. Who is aware of a lot of stuff? Who sort of thinks about things? I fake the rest. You fake the rest. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know a tool at all? Yeah, I met him. He, he actually uh, was in a film that we uh, produced. 
which called a fairy tale, a true story. He played yeah. uh, Arthur Conan Doyle. Yeah. But he's yeah, you know, I've always admired him. I thought he was great. Uh, and yeah, I met him. He's a, a interesting character. Mm -hmm. Very tall and piercing. I mean, like intense. I know. I know. I know. And it was it was just after I went to the set of uh, of Fairy Tale, in where it was at Pinewood, and I was standing there, and he, he sauntered up to say hello. And he uh, so it gets really close, like it's like you can't see very well. So he's like kind of in your space a little bit, and it's like it's like Peter O'Toole is like four inches away, and he's looking at me. It's like hey, and it's. Uh, and he said, uh, it was just after the Oscars, and he said, you're a very bold boy, aren't you? Aren't you? You're yeah. a very clever boy and a very bold boy, too. Yeah. <laughs> like, what did you say? I said, I don't know what you mean. <laughs> and when I interviewed him, we were talking about, I was telling the story about now that you're the, the age you are. He's only 68, but, yeah. you know, I said, at a certain point, some people reach an age in which, and I told him a story about someone who said to me that they were at an age in which they no longer were trying to impress someone. They were expecting people to impress them. Yeah, you know, wow, and he turned that around to me and he said, you know, so I'm happy with who I am. The question is, will I be happy with who you are? <laughs> Which is a little bit like the same wow. thing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. This has been a great year for you, Patriot. Yep. Yeah. Voiceovers. Mm -hmm. yeah. Chicken voiceovers. Chicken voiceovers. Yeah. Eleven herbs and spices. Yeah. You made this. And this. Yeah. Yeah. It's been busy. You feel like you're on a roll? Nah, not really. I, I've had a break since June. I, I. Uh, and before all those things you mentioned, I took 18 months off, you know, because, you know, we had a child. Yeah. Um, the caboose. The caboose came along, yeah. Yeah. yeah Ten years after everyone else, yeah. <laughs> and um, so it was really worthwhile to take that time. And uh, so I don't feel like I'm on a roll or working hard yeah. or anything. It's just got a little busy there for a while. Now it's kind of... Don't want to make Lethal Weapon anymore, or does it depend on something else? No, I don't, I don't want to. I really don't. And... Uh, I suppose things could change, but I, I doubt it. And it, it's hard to stretch a, a thing out for so long. It'd sort of be like episodic television after a while, which I used to do when I was younger, but I didn't like it. Are you the least bit tired of acting? Sometimes, yeah. And and other times, uh, there's always, um, you know, if, if you're in a, a good experience, there's a lot of joy attached to it. I think, uh, and there's an ease that comes with it. Um, that that I didn't have when I was young, you know. There was an anxiety and angst about it, and and yeah. uh, a tension about it. That I think the quicker you get rid of that, the better. Because I don't know what the equivalent of this is, but clearly you're no longer trying to prove anything. No, not really. I'm just trying to do good work and, and have fun at it. Um, How do you make sure that happens? You can be instrumental in that. I think um, there's a you can actually lift the game if if, if you uh, if you feel like it. Uh, it's to do with the working relationship of everyone around you. Do you carry that though? I mean, you take a movie like Patriot, which you are carrying, yeah, as you are with lots of movies. Yeah. I mean, do you feel a real sense of obligation to those colleagues and coworkers, regardless of how much money you might have on uh, absolutely on the line? Absolutely, because you're the guy. If, if you Everybody's fail, sweating. They fail. I mean, yeah. Everybody's sweating it. It's it's a, uh, um, you know, it's rigorous. It's labor, especially a film like that. How do you do it though? You just make sure you do your job. You do your job as well as you can to make less work for them, yeah. and, and make sure they're motivated and inspired. That's right. And you, you have to realize that you're kind of dependent on them in a way too. Um, there's an inter lock there. There's a, you're, you're dependent on one another. Um, I, I don't know. I think it would be, it's easy to get up in the clouds with this stuff and think you're better than, and you're not. And it, that's all there is to it. You've all you've just got different skills. Yeah. Um, so that's important. And it's important to let those people around you understand that what they do is important, because it is. And uh, once they get that, man, everybody's gung-ho. It's a, it's a good, uh, morale is good. Mm. Who have you relied on? Who have been good friends? I mean, I, I know that at some point you've talked to people like Clint Eastwood. Yeah. About you know, directing, you know, yeah. place directing. It's terrifying. You, <laughs> you were terrifying. Yeah. yeah. And, and so and the conversation goes like this. What You call him up and you just say, hey. Hey, Clint. He goes, hey. And like that, and he goes, <laughs> <laughs> I call him the tall one. The tall one. Yeah, well, you meet him. He's like, hey. Yeah, yeah. He's a big guy. Um, 
and uh, uh, he said, "Hey, I'm, I'm, I saw your film. You know, I was talking about the Unforgiven. Right. I really dug it. I did too. I said, great movie, great script, blah blah blah." And he said, "Thanks." He's a man of few words. And uh, I said, "Listen, I'm about to direct something." I said, uh, "Quite frankly, I'm terrified." And he said, "Hey, don't worry about it." I said, well, "Why, Clint? Just tell me why." <laughs> Hoping tell against hope on the receiver. <laughs> he said, uh, "Hey, a lot of this is just subliminal. You picked it up along the way. It'll all come back." I go, oh, cool. I didn't know if I quite believed it, but it made yeah, me feel better. Feel I said, better, well, yeah. I'll just start and see what happens. Bang. Yeah. And uh, he was right. He was right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, after, you know, 18, 20 years hanging around the hub of activity on a film set, you've kind of, stuff has just gone through an osmosis, you know. You've... Can you see a time in which you'll say, look, I, I, unless it's a fabulous role, I don't really want to do that anymore. What I really want to do is direct or... <laughs> I, uh, yeah. Uh, one gets a lot of scripts, and they're good scripts sometimes, but they're just, you know, you kind of feel like you've been there already, so it's like, yeah. they, what's the point, you know, unless you're, you know, trying to meet the mortgage or something. Um, so sometimes you just try and dig a little deeper or just wait, you know, for the next thing to come, or sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, there's there's really no pressure on me, which no, is good. Really, yeah. and, 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 and you don't feel any any pressure. You don't feel like I've got to make a movie every couple of years. No? Oh, yeah. You don't have any insecurities that you can... Oh, I've got plenty. <laughs> <laughs> what are we talking here? Insecurities? Hey, yeah. <laughs> well, like what? <laughs> Does my ass look fat in this suit? I mean, oh, come on. Nah, you know, I'm kidding. The vanity uh, thing is not real. The vanity? Nah, it's too late for that. Yeah, you know? exactly. Um, you know... It's, you don't worry about failure. Well, nobody wants to fail. Yeah, I know, but you... Um, you know, enough confidence to know that if you fail, you fail. I mean, what's the worst thing about it is you can fail. fail. And then the worst thing about it is the movie makes no money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's happened. Yeah, yeah, and uh, it's, okay. And it might have been because it was a crappy movie and you were bad yeah, in it. Exactly. And you failed. Yeah, and that's the worst case scenario. So, you know, what would you do if you're not doing this? Uh, mm, Acting, directing, producing. Yeah. I don't know. I it's mean, you could just hang out. You mean just ha I, I I would get busy on something. I'm yeah, not quite sure, sure what. Yeah. Uh, but uh, uh, just since June, for instance, I mean I've done. Man, I've uh, I've just gotten into all kinds of reading and other little projects, and I've been going to Europe and looking at art and uh, um, and learning about the history of the Florentines and and uh, you know all the there's a hotbed of murder and corruption and you know and like uh, the, all that period of this great art came out of it that was just like. Uh, from all that decay, you know. Um, so, I mean, there's always something, you know. I want to go to Machu Picchu and look at it. I mean, there's the things yeah. that you read about and you just want to do them, you know. And if you, if, if you have the luxury of doing that, I mean, I, I'm very thankful. I mean, it's like uh, not, not everyone can just pick up and do that. So I'm fortunate. It's great to have you here. Hey. This is, the movie is called What Women Want. You are fascinating. Thank you for coming. Thanks, Charlie. Enjoyed it very much. Yeah. No Gibson for the hour. Thank you for joining us. That was an hour. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> See you next time. Uh, one of you would help me, please. Um, I want to buy a gramophone. A what? A gramophone. <laughs> gramophone. <laughs> a gramophone. I don't think we've got any gramophones here, Grandad. <laughs> What's that? That's a three-hour automatic cut direct drive turntable, unless I'm very much mistaken. Well, what's the difference between that and a gramophone? Well, about 30 years in a plastic cupboard, are you, Chief? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd like one of these, please. You sure? Yes, please. All right. This, this is going to be good. Right. Well, as you can see, it's uh, it's got all the speeds. It's got 33 and 45. Yes. What, what do it... I do with my old 78s? <laughs> <laughs> what do you say? Nothing. Nothing. Uh, you said what about my old 78s, didn't you? <laughs> no, no, I didn't. Honestly, no. All right. So you got your deck. Right. Do you want a Dolby with it? Uh, yes, please. <laughs> Tape recorders, Chief, all right? Do you want an amp? Uh, no, I won't. <laughs> you aren't hearing it.
anything, Grandad, without an app, I'm afraid. Oh, so, of course, I, yes, I want an app. Uh, yes, yes, an app. Yes, All right, what sort of output are you looking for? What sort have you got? Ah. <laughs> no, no clues. <laughs> About medium? How many watts exactly? Oh, I should think about, um, about three. <laughs> no, two, two thousand. <laughs> five, five hundred. <laughs> thirty. 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 <laughs> so you know all about it now, do you? Do you want a thirty watt amp? A thirty watt amp. Do you want speakers? Yes. Do you want rumble filters? Yes. Do you want a bag on your head? Yes. <laughs> there we are, there we are. <laughs> so you got your deck, you got your app, you got your rumble filters, and of course, you got your bag on your head. Now, do you want woofers and tweeters? No, I don't want stupid <laughs> things like woofers. Well, you got them when you want them or not, Grandad. They're in your speakers. <laughs> You'll be telling us you don't want slimline salad dressing. Yes, I do want <laughs> slimline salad dressing. Tonight we tackle a difficult and controversial subject, soccer hooliganism. With me in the studio, I have Professor Duff of Cambridge University, author of Crowd Control Psychology, and Sally Barnes, community worker from the borough of Lambeth. Now, over the last few weeks, both of you have been looking into the problem of English soccer crowd violence. What conclusions have you drawn, Professor Duff? Well, my team and I have really concerned ourselves fundamentally with a uh, statistical analysis of soccer violence as a whole, in tandem with and related to a uh, psychochemical and, uh, broadly speaking, a behavioural analysis of over a thousand individual soccer hooligans. And we've come to the inevitable conclusion that the one course of action that the authorities must take is to cut off their ghoulies. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry? Cut their ghoulies off. <laughs> yes. Well... Sally, I'm sure you'll have something to say about that point of view. Look, Jonathan, I know these kids. Um, <laughs> I've worked in the areas we're talking about around Lambeth, Lewisham. Um, I know their problems. I know their frustrations, lack of community facilities. I know their parents. And in my opinion, Professor Duff's suggestion that we should cut off their ghoulies is the only solution. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, cut the ghoulies off. Cut them off. Through. Well, uh, there we have it. <laughs> Whip off the ghoulies. <laughs> Expert opinion seems to be in favour of, of uh, cutting off them. <laughs> right. Come in. <laughs> The woman who's been a guinea pig for the new contraceptive sponge says it's no good, as she's now got a cake in the oven. <laughs> well, that was an excerpt from the controversial and some would say scurrilous new British picture, the General Synod's Life of Christ. <laughs> the film deals with the rise to fame and greatness of a humble carpenter's son named Jesus Christ. But many people have seen in the film a thinly disguised and blasphemous attack on the life of Monty Python. <laughs> Python worshippers claim the film sets out to ridicule by parody the actual members of Monty Python. <laughs> Men who even today are worshipped and revered throughout the Western world. <laughs> now, Alexander Walker, what did you think of the picture? <clears throat> well, I, I was appalled. I mean, I actually find it deeply offensive that in a country that is still ostensibly a python-worshipping country, <laughs> that a 14-year-old child can actually get in to see this film. I mean, there is, there is little enough proper python around these days without parading this distorted garbage about. Bishop, you directed the film. Uh, did you expect this kind of reaction? <laughs> well, well, I certainly didn't expect the Spanish Inquisition. <laughs> yes. Yes, I did. Yes, I did direct the film. And I feel as though I must emphasize at this stage that it is not about Python. Oh, come on. I'm not a Pythonist. <laughs> I'm not a Pythonist myself. But obviously, I have a tremendous amount of respect for people like Alexander, who are... Oh, come now. I... now. Come now, Bishop. I mean, the leading figure in this film, what is it? Uh, uh, Je Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ. I mean, it's quite clear. 
quite clearly a lampoon of the comic messiah himself, <laughs> our Lord John Cleese. <laughs> well, come on, I mean, even the initials no, JC no, no, are exactly the same. No, look, I, feel, no, look, I, feel, I must explain. I feel it. I, I must explain to you, the Christ figure is not clean. Oh, come on. No, he's just an ordinary man who happens to have been born in Western Supermare at the same time <laughs> as Mr. Clean. Jonathan, you no, know that, as well no, as I he do. Is mistaken, the point he is mistaken for the comic messiah I'm himself sorry. by vast crowds of people who follow him about, doing silly walks, um, shouting, your shouting, no, no, not the comfy chair, and <laughs> other <laughs> slogans from the good box. No, I'm... S and, <laughs> I'm sorry, John I'm sorry, Jonathan, whatever you say, this film is a highly distasteful one. I mean, have people forgotten how Monty Python suffered for us? I know. How often the sketches failed? I mean, these men died for us, frequently. I mean, if Python is immortal, as Pythonists believe, then I'm, I can't believe that a mere film, a tenth rate, could put them off. I mean, in the words, in the words of John Cleese, whenever two or three are gathered together in one place, then they shall perform the parrot sketch. It is an ex. It is an ex parrot. It, it has, has ceased to be. Indeed. Well, Alexander Walker, the final scene of the picture has attracted the most attention. Right. Well, I mean, this. I mean, now, now here, I think we have the ultimate blasphemy. I mean, ultimate. it is. It is set in a hotel in Torquay, where literally hundreds of Spanish waiters are being clipped about the ear by this Jesus Christ bloke. Um, it, it, it is obviously a lampoon of the comic messiah's greatest half it's hour. It's not at all. The point, it's well, Torbay. Well, thank you both oh, very much Torbay, indeed. Oh, Torbay, Torquay. Uh, I mean, Bishop, uh, Alexander Walker, thank you very much indeed. Thank, thank you. you. Quiet, Daniel! Quiet! Will you never be still with your devilish noise day and night? Stop! Stop! <laughs> Great Old Chestnuts of the World Number 8 The Swedish Chemist's Shop Good afternoon Can I help you, sir? Yes, I would like some deodorant, please Ball or aerosol? <laughs> Neither I want it for my armpits <laughs> Good evening Songs of Praise this Sunday comes from our lovely old parish church of St. Stephen in the heart of the West Country. And I welcome you all to our simple service. You join a full congregation of local people who have come to worship tonight. Indeed, it makes quite a change to have so many here. <laughs> Because it wasn't quite the same story last week, <laughs> was it? <laughs> last week, the congregation numbered seven. <laughs> Four of whom had turned up a week early by mistake. <laughs> and the week before that, Harvest Sunday, there were three of us. <laughs> Myself, the organist, Mr. Posner, and a tin of spaghetti. <laughs> Where were you bastards then? <laughs> Sitting on your fat agnostic asses in front of Holiday 82, I should think. <laughs> Watching the Reverend Cliff Mitchellmore preaching on suntan availability in the Algarve. <laughs> Not tonight, eh? Oh, no. Not when there's a chance of getting your fizzog on the goggle box. <laughs> you trot along in your nasty little suits. And my God, didn't the hat shop do well this week? <laughs> You come swanning in here, sitting on pews that haven't seen your bum or any bum in a month of Sundays. 
You don't know whether to sit, kneel, or stand. You're up and down like a whore's drawers. <laughs> Christ was right, wasn't he? When two or three are gathered together in my name, the service can't be on television. <laughs> oh, to hell with it. We'll sing hymn number 387. Good Christian men rejoice, the Bieber back in town. <laughs> Dozens of receivers closed hundreds of factories, and there are thousands more teetering on the brink in Wales. <laughs> Mr. Wimble? That's me. I'm Claire Wimbush. Oh, hello, lass. I'm from the Youth Opportunities Programme. Well, sit down, sit down, sit down. <laughs> what can I do for you? Have a rumbly spy. <laughs> Thank you very much. Mr. Rumbly. over the past 12 months, we've sent you uh, 117 unemployed school leavers and... I'm here to see how they're getting along. Oh. Uh, well, uh, <laughs> um, yes. You see, Rumbley's Pies and Sausages are one of our most cooperative local employers. And, uh, I mean, we've never had any complaints from No, them. no. No, well, you wouldn't have. <laughs> Not from the kids, leastways. How are they getting along, Mr Rumbley? I mean, are they getting plenty of on-the-job training, for example? Well, I'm using them mainly for filling in. Uh, <laughs> as so, it were. Uh, well, I must say, Mr Rumbley, you are the ideal employer. And not a hint of racial prejudice. No, no. Bloody well hope not. Care for a black pudding? <laughs> the weather is unusually inclement for the time of year. Let us hope it is so in Leningrad. Ivan. Adrian. You are an old friend of Squiffy, yes? Yes. He was my tutor at Cambridge. Cambridge. It's good. Very good. Tell me, what do you do in England? I, I'm a freelance sculptor. Very good. You know, of course, what this will entail. Yes. Yes, I do. There's no going back, you know. No. Excellent. We'll leave for Moscow tonight. Wonderful. I think I'll be the best spy you've ever had. Spy? Spy? No boyfriend of mine goes out to work. <laughs>